In the last lecture, we have studied the basic theory of oscillator circuits. We have seen that for an amplifier with positive feedback to oscillate without an input signal, what you need is to satisfy the Birkhausen criterion A, the gain of the amplifier times beta, the feedback fraction, must be 1. Since A or beta or both could be complex numbers, this really is a complex number relation, which means that this is really two relations in one. One stating that the real part of A beta has to be equal to 1, the other stating that the imaginary part of A beta must vanish. We have also seen several examples of circuits which implement the Birkhausen criterion. That is, we have seen examples of oscillators like the Wienbridge oscillator and phase shift oscillators. Today we are going to study a class of oscillators which are very very important, especially for high frequency work. They are called tuned oscillators. In a tuned oscillator, basically what you have is an amplifier with its uh, open loop gain, that is gain without feedback of AO and an output impedance of ZO. What we also have connected to the output is this so-called tank circuit where you have Z1, Z2 and Z3, three impedances. The nature of these impedances will be identified in the course of this discussion. Now, these three impedances actually are not exactly in a series parallel combination because there is a part which is fed back from the junction of Z2 and Z3 back to the input of the amplifier. However, what we are going to assume at least initially is that this amplifier has a huge, huge input impedance. It draws almost no current. So this branch which connects the Z2, Z3 junction back to the input of the amplifier actually just samples the voltage, ensures that the voltage here is fed back here, but draws no current. And hence you can think of Z3 and Z2 as being in CDs and this CDs combination being in parallel with Z1. So the net impedance of this combination, which we are calling ZL, that's given by Z1 into Z2 plus Z3 divided by Z1 plus Z2 plus Z3. Now, if you look at the output part of this amplifier, what you have, of course, is the effective circuit. AOVI is the voltage source. That's in series with an impedance ZO, the output impedance. And ZL is connected across that. So the output voltage VO of the circuit is given by ZL by ZL plus ZO into AOVI and that means the actual gain of the amplifier is given by AO into ZL by ZL plus ZO. So this is this really is the ratio VO by VI. So is this voltage here and VI of course is this voltage here. The fraction of this VO which is fed back to the input can be easily figured out since we have assumed that the amplifier draws no current and hence this Z3 and Z2 are really in CDs and so we can use the CDs potential division formula. And that tells us beta is simply given by Z2 divided by the net impedance that is Z2 plus Z3. So this ratio gives us beta. Now what we need is the quantity A beta in order to apply the Barkhausen criterion and when you multiply A by beta and do some very simple manipulations, in fact the first thing here is actually A, all I have done is multiplied the numerator and the denominator in ZL by ZL plus ZO by the quantity Z1 plus Z2 plus Z3 to arrive here and this is of course beta and when you multiply this, these two things cancel and you are left with this rather simple looking result. A beta is actually A0 into Z1 
times z2 by z1 into z2 plus z3 plus z0 into the sum of the three impedances. Now, just for the sake of simplicity and also because this is the most common scenario in actual practical circuits, what we will assume is that all the three impedances which make up the tank circuit are purely reactive. That is, they are either pure inductances or pure capacitances. So, Zi for i going from 1 to 3 is given by j times xi where xi is some real number. Of course, uh, xi is positive and proportional to omega if it refers to an inductance and it's negative and inversely proportional to omega if it refers to a capacitance. But in both cases, these are pure, zi is a purely imaginary and we have written them as j times the reactance xi which is purely real. Again, for the sake of simplicity, and also because that is a common scenario, we are going to consider Z0 to be purely real. Now, if we substitute Zi equal to Jxi for i equal to 1, 2, and 3, in this expression for A beta, what we are going to get is minus x1, x2 in the numerator. The denominator will have minus x1 into x2 plus x3. The minus sign coming, of course, from multiplying the two j's. Whereas, the other term in the denominator will simply be plus, simply be plus j z0 into x1 plus x2 plus x3. So, ultimately, this boils down to this particular expression for a beta. a beta is a0 into x1 x2 by x1 into x2 plus x3 minus j into x0 into x1 plus x2 plus x3. Let me remind you that we have assumed that a0, x1, x2, x3 and x0 which is, which I should really write z0 or r0 are all real quantities. Now because the Buckhausen criterion needs to be satisfied for oscillations, that is we are demanding a beta equals 1, the expression on the right hand side must be purely real, which means the imaginary term in the denominator should vanish. So x0 into x1 plus x2 plus x3 must be 0. And since the output impedance, no matter how small, is actually there, it's not exactly 0, we end up with the demand that x1 plus x2 plus x3 has to be 0. So the three reactances of the components of the tank circuit must vanish when added together and that tells us that they must be mixed. They can't all be of the same kind. There must be either two capacitors and an inductor or two inductors and a capacitor. And also these reactions are frequency dependent and they do not depend on the frequency in exactly the same fashion. As a result, the net reactance would vanish, but only at one particular frequency, and that is the frequency at which this circuit will oscillate. Note, however, that the quantity A beta being purely real is not the only demand that we get from Buckhausen criterion. We also get that the value of A beta should be 1. Actually, A beta should be 1 for sustained oscillations, but remember, it's basically tiny thermal fluctuations which then build up into a finite oscillation. So at least to begin with, in order for the oscillations to grow, you will need A beta to be real and more than one. Now at the frequency at which this circuit can oscillate, that is the frequency at which x1 plus x2 plus x3 vanishes, A beta simplifies substantially. Of course, this term goes away. Not only that, x2 plus x3 in the denominator here gets replaced by minus x1. So once you cancel out the two x1s here, you get minus a0 into x2 by x1. So this quantity has to be equal to 1 for self-sustained oscillations and bigger than 1 for oscillations to grow. So for self-sustained oscillations, you need a0, the raw gain of the amplifier, to be given by minus x1 by x2. Strictly speaking, what you need for the oscillations to build up 
is magnitude of A0 must exceed the magnitude of X1 by X2 in order that the oscillations start. Of course, the sign has to be just right. And once the oscillations build up enough, it's usually the inherent nonlinearities in the amplifier or sometimes in the feedback circuit, which actually limit the amplitude from growing too far. Sometimes, of course, the nonlinearities inherently present in the circuit may be too small, and there you need to artificially add nonlinear components. You have already seen an example of this when we studied the voltage stabilization or amplitude stabilization of the Wienbridge oscillator in the last lecture. Now, before we go on to talk about the possible choices for the components which make up the tank circuit, let me just show you another alternative way of drawing the same circuit, which is very common in textbooks. The way we have drawn it on the left is one which emphasizes the nature of the amplifier. Then you have a feedback circuit and the feedback voltage is being taken back to the input. However, very often this circuit, the same circuit is drawn in a slightly different manner. It may take a bit of thought to see that this circuit on the right here is exactly the same circuit as this one. But let me just give you a quick explanation if you can't spot it just by looking at it. Well, Z1, the impedance, is connected between the output of the amplifier and the ground. So that's what is done here. The amplifier output is here. This end is the amplifier output. And Z1 is connected between that and the ground. Z2 is connected between the ground and this point, which in turn is connected to the input of the amplifier. So the input of the amplifier is here. This is the ground. Z2 is connected to that. This, of course, is just the amplifier ground connection. And finally, Z3, this impedance here, actually is connected between the output and the input. So between this point and this point. So although these two circuits look a bit different at first sight, they're really talking about exactly the same connections. The reason why I showed you this one is that many textbooks actually have this as a form for the from the, for the basic tuned amplifier circuit. And very often you will see circuits which look like this drawn in books and you should not get confused into thinking that this is really something else and not the same as this circuit. Now, going back to A0 equals minus x1 by x2, what does it say? It says that if A0 is positive, then x1 and x2 must be of opposite kind. That is, one can be a capacitor, the other can be an inductor. x3 then is open. It, it takes whatever value it needs to take to get x1 plus x2 plus x2 to vanish. And if that number turns out to be positive, then you have an inductor. If it turns out to be negative, then it's a capacitor. On the other hand, if the amplifier is inverting so that the raw gain A0 is less than 0, x1 and x2 must be of the same kind because then the left hand side of this expression a0 equals minus x1 by x2 is negative the right hand side also has to be so x1 and x2 must have the same sign of course then in order that x1 plus x2 plus x3 vanish x3 must be of the other kind so you could have two capacitors and an inductor or two inductors and a capacitor indeed for an inverting amplifier, the circuit which uses two inductors and a capacitor is a well-known circuit, well-known oscillator circuit. It's called the Hartley oscillator. And again, for an inverting amplifier, you could use two capacitors and a single inductor. And that's also a well-known important circuit. That's called the Colpitts oscillator. Now, I'm going to go into a bit more detail now and for one major reason some of the assumptions that we have made while deriving the oscillation conditions above may be slightly impractical in real life in particular the one major demand that we made that the amplifier does not load the feedback circuit that is it doesn't draw any current away from the feedback circuit so that the feedback circuit can really be taken as a series parallel combination 
may not be right in many situations, especially if you're using, uh, say, an amplifier based on a bipolar junction transistor. After all, bipolar junction transistors work by amplifying currents. So it has to draw some current. Maybe a small current, but that current may not be sufficiently small that you can ignore this altogether. So in what is going to come, we are going to describe the call piece oscillator in particular. I am going to describe the BJT version of the call piece oscillator, where you will see that the calculation will have to be redone a bit. It's slightly different results, but the basic idea of the oscillations persists. Then I am also going to talk about a FET based oscillator, call piece oscillator again, that is two capacitors and one inductor. And although the nature of the analysis there will be slightly different, we will again see that the circuit will also oscillate at a particular frequency and we'll, we will also find out the condition of on the FET transconductance. Similarly, for the BJT amplifier, we will find the condition on the transistors HFE, the forward current gain, in order that oscillations can occur. Now, we are not going to discuss the Hartley oscillator in the same amount of detail for the simple reason that the analysis is very similar, so you can do it yourself once you have seen the call piece oscillator analysis. Let me also warn you that in the case of the Hartley oscillator, there is a small complication which may arise when you put two inductors very close to each other, as you would usually do when you are making the Hartley oscillator. Then the magnetic field produced by the coil of one of the inductors will induce a flux in the other coil. So, a change of the current in one inductor will also induce an EMF in the other. So, this is the phenomenon of mutual inductance. So, for the Hartley oscillator, in addition to the reactance caused by the two inductances and of course by the capacitor, uh, you will also take into account the mutual inductance. It's slightly more complicated to do, but it's really not that much difficult in the end. It's essentially the same kind of analysis as for the call pits. So let us now first take a look at the bipolar junction transistor based call pits oscillator. Let us now discuss the call pits oscillator constructed using a bipolar junction transistor. The circuit for the call pits oscillator is on the left here. Now focus your attention on the part drawn in blue out here, this portion. You would easily recognize that this is a standard common emitter amplifier with a potential divider bias and C1, C2 are blocking capacitors. You have a bias stabilizing resistance RE here, which is bypassed using CE. So that at AC frequencies, this is just shorted to the ground. The only unfamiliar thing here would be that instead of using a resistance here, RC, we are actually using a radio frequency choke. That's what RFC stands for here. Now, you could actually construct a circuit, especially if it's meant to work at low frequencies, using a resistance RC here. But the reason why we are using the a radio frequency choke, or we often use a radio frequency choke when we construct oscillators like this, is the following. In the AC equivalent, once we have understood the biasing, that is what we are going to take a look at in some detail to understand oscillations. VCC is going to be shorted to the ground, which means the radio frequency choke is going to be inserted in the AC equivalent between the collector and the ground. So it will be an additional load which can draw away some of the output current. And that will of course reduce the output that you are going to get. However, if the oscillation frequency of our oscillator is large enough, then the impedances, impedance of the inductor in this radio frequency choke is going to be very huge. As a result, at the frequency of interest, it is going to essentially behave like an open circuit. So it will not really be loading the collector, loading the output, and drawing away current from it at the frequency range we are interested in. So, as you can see, there is nothing connected between the collector and the ground. 
at least RFC is not connected between the collector and the ground in the AC equivalent circuit simply because we can treat it effectively as an open circuit at the frequencies involved. And these frequencies are large enough so that the capacitors C1, C2 and E can be treated as shorts, zero impedances, so they have just been shorted out in the AC equivalent circuit. Of course, because uh, C is a short, it shorts out RE as well, so the emitter is directly connected to the ground. So, basically the only thing that is left of the DC biasing path is this R2 and R1 which come in parallel. Remember VCC is now in the effective AC equivalent is shorted to the ground. So R1 and R2 come in parallel giving rise to the RB. Now very often this RB is huge enough for us to treat as an open circuit. But for the time being I am going to leave it in because for many situations RB is not that huge an impedance. So that leaves just a tank circuit to be connected and if you look at this carefully you will find that because C2 is shorted the collector and the ground has C1 between them which is what you have. Note that the capacitor C1 and C2 in the tank circuit are much smaller than these blue capacitors which unfortunately have also denoted C1 and C2. Maybe I should change the notation and call them CB1 and CB2 which is what we did earlier when we talked about amplifiers, the CE amplifier. CB1, CB2 are the two blocking capacitors which are large and because their impedance is 1 over omega C at the frequency of interest they essentially have zero impedance. Whereas C1, C2 are much smaller capacitors, they still have substantial impedance at the frequency of interest. In fact, the frequency of interest is set in part by their impedances. So we don't short them out. C1 is connected between the collector and the ground as I said. C2 on the other hand is connected between the ground and the base. So that's it. On the other hand, L is connected between the input and the output of the amplifier. So between the collector and the base, right? That's how it's connected if you look at it this way. And I've just redrawn it so that it's again connected between the collector and the base. So once you have replaced the CB1 and CB2 capacitors and the CE with shorts, RFC with an open circuit, VCC has been shorted to the ground. This is the effective AC equivalent circuit that you're left with. So we need to analyze this in order to figure out the condition for oscillations. We cannot immediately just borrow the results that we had derived a while ago for the simple reason that the BJT is going to draw current. So the assumption that we had made there that the feedback network is not loaded at all by the amplifier, that actually will not be correct. So we have to work on it directly. In order to analyze the AC equivalent circuit which has been redrawn on the left here, we need to replace the transistor by a simplified equivalent model. I am going to use the simplified H parameter model. Let me just remind you what that is. A transistor with its base, collector and emitter as marked for small signal AC applications can be replaced by its equivalent which is HIE connected between the base and the emitter and an HFE times IB where IB is the current here. This HFE IB is a current controlled current source connected between the collector and the emitter. Of course, this is the version of the H parameter model that we get when we ignore the very small quantities HOE and HRE. And that is exactly what we are going to use here. I have replaced the transistor essentially by the emitter connected here, collector here, and the base here. Note that that's exactly what we had. All we are doing is replacing the transistor by this equivalent circuit to arrive at this. And what I have also done is combine the C2 and RB together 
into a single impedance which is RB parallel with 1 by g omega c2. Now, before we go on to analyze this, let me just put in a caveat here. Strictly speaking, the H-parameter model with this simple form is not really a very good approximation for a transistor at high frequencies. To model a transistor at high frequencies with standard parameter values, it might be better to use something called a hybrid pi model, which is an effective model for a transistor, which also takes into account the parasitic capacitances which a transistor has and which essentially becomes effective at high frequencies. So you should actually treat the results that we are going to obtain with a bit of caution. Though the H-parameter model, especially the simplified H-parameter model, is a decent approximation at low frequencies, at high frequencies is slightly iffy, if I say, can put it that way. And uh, though the conclusions that you will draw from this calculation are more or less correct at a qualitative level, if you want quantitatively more precise results, you should actually use a more accurate model, which is better at least at modeling a transistor at high frequencies. Having said that, we are not going to go and talk about the more complicated hybrid pi model or anything else in this lecture. We are going to just work with the simplified H-parameter model and see what this predicts as far as the oscillation frequency and the conditions for oscillation to start are concerned. Uh, let me warn you once again, these results may not be absolutely precise if the predicted frequency turns out to be too huge, but they will be in the right ballpark. Let us now try to analyze this effective AC equivalent and see whether this circuit is going to go into oscillations of its own. In this analysis, we are not going to try to calculate the feedback fraction beta or the loop gain A beta directly. What we are going to do is we are going to simply analyze and try to determine the current through this circuit. And if we do get a non-zero current, remember there is no AC source here. The only AC source you can see in this circuit is a controlled source. So if this circuit actually produces a non-zero AC current, that means it's oscillating on its own. So basically we are going to try to set up equations which describe the circuit and try to see whether those equations are consistent with a non-zero solution for the currents involved. Now, we are going to use Maxwell's mesh method or loop method to analyze this. I have set up three loop currents, I1, I2, I3, as you can see indicated here, with three obvious loops that you can see. But there is one immediate problem. In the loop method, you need to write down the total voltage drop as you go across a mesh. However, in two of the obvious meshes you can see here, this one and this one, you have this current source HFEIB sitting in the middle. Now, you cannot say a priori what the voltage drop across a current source is going to be. It could be anything depending on the other circuit components. So it would be impossible to write down Maxwell's mesh equations for this mesh and this mesh. However, the fact that the current here is IB and the current here is bound to be HFEIB leads immediately to two relations between these mesh currents. I1 minus I2 is the current through HIE and that has to be equal to IB minus IB. Remember, I1 points this way, I2 points this way, so I1 minus I2 is a net current this way. So that's minus IB. On the other hand, I1 minus I3 is a net current flowing in this direction, in this wire, so that has to be equal to HFE times IB. So we see that the three mesh currents are actually related to each other rather easily. I2 happens to be I1 plus IB, and I3 happens to be I1 minus HFEI. So now, what we are going to do is take a look at two meshes for which we can actually directly write down the Kirchhoff's voltage law equations. 
वन ऑफ देम विल बी दिस वन सो हियर द मेश क्वेश्चन इज वेरी सिंपल इज गोइंग टू बी एच आई ई प्लस जेड टाइम्स लूप करेंट आई टू माइनस एच आई ई टाइम्स आई वन दिस इज स्टैंडर्ड मैक्सवेल्स मेश मेथड बींग यूज हियर and this has to be equal to 0 now i2 we already know is i1 plus ib so if you plug that in here you will see that hie i1 term will cancel so we will be left with zi1 plus hie plus zib equals 0 and this immediately relates i1 to ib i1 must be given by minus 1 plus hie by z times ib so that's from this particular mesh the other mesh for which you can write down the voltage law equations directly because it does not have a current source in it is this big mesh here the outer square so to speak and when you traverse the outer square and write down the equation what you get is a drop of j omega l times i1 across l then drop of 1 by j omega c1 times i3 across c1 then drop of z times i2 across this impedance that i'm calling z remember this is the r and c2 parallel combination and these three voltage drops together must add up to the net voltage drop in the loop which is of course zero according to kershaw's voltage law now here what i will do is i will just use the results that we have already found out that i2 is i1 plus ib and i3 is i1 minus hfe ib and if i do that and collect all the terms together I end up with this equation: J omega L plus one by J omega C one plus Z I one. This is these are the I one terms coming in, and you have this times minus H F E I B that gives you the minus H F E by J omega C one term here plus Z times I B. So that's here. Now you can now substitute the expression for I one that you have here. plug it in here then you get a factor into ib equals 0 and since we want to ensure that this circuit has non zero currents i will insist that ib is not zero and that will leave us with this demand that this whole th thing times this factor with plus this must be zero what we have done is we have multiplied through by j omega c1 so that this actually gives you Minus omega square LC one. This of course gives you one, and this gives you J omega C one Z. So that's this bracket. You are putting a one plus H I E by Z times minus one here from here, and multiplying through by J omega C one here gives me J omega C one Z minus H F E equals. This whole thing has to be equal to zero. So this is the condition that we have for oscillations. Now this of course is a complex condition, so it will. Have to be broken up into a real part and an imaginary part. But before that, we just expand this out a bit. This is minus one minus omega square L C one up to this into one plus H I E by Z. You multiply J omega C one Z with this. There's a minus sign outside. You get minus J omega C one Z, and then you get a term in which the Z cancels. You get minus J omega C one H I E. You also have plus J omega C one Z from here, minus H F E of course. so these two terms cancel each other out now what i am going to do is replace z which is there only in one term now by rb divided by 1 plus j omega c2 r or simply 1 by rb plus j omega c2 which is of course the fact that admittances for a parallel branch add up so this is the entire condition that we have but as i said this is a complex condition so it actually gives rise to two conditions one for the real part another for the imaginary part now if you take the imaginary part first what you need to do is take this number which is of course real and multiply it by the imaginary part which comes from this so it's minus 1 minus omega square lc1 times the imaginary part here is simply hie times omega c2 that's what is multiplying j the rb is of course cancel out here so that's coming from this term from this term you are going to get minus omega c1 hie and just by 
cancelling out the HIE and just multiplying the two terms together, say cancelling out the HIE and the omega and multiplying the first bracket through by C2, you end up with omega square LC1 C2 minus C2 and you have minus C1 from here. This has to be equal to 0 and this immediately tells me what omega square is going to be. Omega square is going to be C1 plus C2 divided by LC1 C2. The frequency here is basically that of an inductance and C1 C2 tank put together. That's the angular frequency. The frequency in hertz would turn out to be 1 by 2 pi root over C1 plus C2 by LC1 C2. So the imaginary part here directly tells us what the frequency of oscillation must be. What about the conditions for oscillations to occur? Well, if you now take a look at the real part of this expression, what you get is the following. You get 1 minus omega square LC1 with a minus sign from here into 1 plus HIE by RB and you get a minus HFE from here. Now, given the fact that omega square LC1 C2 is equal to C1 plus C2, it's easy to see that omega square LC1 will be C1 plus C2 divided by C2. That is 1 plus C1 by C2. So this whole factor in front essentially will be C1 over C2. So this gives us an expression for HFE. HFE is given by C1 by C2 into 1 plus HIE by RB. Uh, now, of course, this is the value for of HFE that is needed for self-sustained oscillations. But what you actually need to start the oscillations and make them grow starting from tiny thermal fluctuations is a value of HFE which is more than this. Now, since typically the value of HFE that most transistors have is of the order of 100 or more, it should be reasonably simple to find out circuit combinations for which this condition HFE is bigger than C1 by C2 into 1 plus HIE by RB is satisfied. So, a Colbitz oscillator can easily start. Now, of course, what is important is that if this condition of HFE being bigger than the right-hand side here is satisfied throughout, then the amplitude is going to keep on growing until the output saturates and you do not really end up getting a sinusoidal oscillation. What we rely on are the nonlinearities that a transistor has, especially at high frequencies, which will limit the gain once the amplitude becomes big enough. Since that is that since that amount of nonlinearity is present in most transistors, a Colpis oscillator based on a BJT is a circuit which essentially works fine. Now, of course, this particular condition was derived using the simplified H parameter model, which, as I've already told you, is not exactly accurate, at least at high frequencies. A more careful analysis should be carried out if you wanted to pinpoint precisely the condition needed. But frankly, all you need, all this condition is telling you is that HFE has to be bigger than a particular value and that's not a very tight bound. So this is essentially good enough for most practical purposes. Let me also point out that this condition on the gain that we have derived is actually different from the condition that we had found out when we did the general analysis of a tuned amplifier oscillator circuit a while ago, when we did the general analysis of a tuned oscillator circuit a while ago, but as I've already pointed out, that was because that analysis was done under the assumption that the amplifier does not load the feedback network, which is of course not the case here. However, the Frequency that you are going to get for the oscillate. However, the frequency of oscillations that we have obtained here exactly matches the frequency given by x1 plus x2 plus x3 equal to 0. And the final condition, the condition on HFE, though not accurate, is reasonably 
okay for practical purposes. And that shows that the conclusions that we had drawn about the nature of the circuit components needed for the tank circuit from the analysis that we had done before actually works pretty well even in this case where, the, where some of the more restrictive assumptions do not really work. The Colpace oscillator using a BJT is a pretty useful oscillator circuit, especially for high frequency applications. We are next going to study a Colby's oscillator using a field effect transistor. Although the basic results will be similar, there will be a very big difference in the analysis involved, primarily because of the fact that a FET, after all, is a voltage control device and it's a very high input impedance device. So let us now turn to that. On the left here, we have a Colpis oscillator made using a Jeffet, a junction field effect transistor. It has been constructed essentially by adding the Colpis tank circuit to a common source amplifier with potential divider bias. The self biasing resistance RS has been bypassed with the bypass capacitor CS and your blocking capacitor CB1, CB2, which helps the biasing to be protected from the tank circuit. And the circuit is really very, very similar to the C amplifier based circuit that we have just seen. The only difference is that instead of a transistor, we have a field effect transistor here. And the AC equivalent works in exactly the same way. The transistor has been replaced by the FET here with a the, with the gate on this side drain here and the source here, which has been shorted to the ground. And we have C1 between the drain and the ground as before. Okay, th there it was collector and the ground, but these are analogous connections. And you have this R1, R2 parallel combination RB here, and C2 once again connected between the ground, and in this case the gate. It was the ground and the base earlier. And L, of course, as before, straddling the input and the output, in this case connected between the drain and the source. So that's the AC equivalent circuit. But we have not yet replaced the FET itself by its equivalent small signal circuit. And that's what we are going to do next. As before, we are going to combine C2 and RB to form a impedance Z, which is RB parallel 1 by G, G omega C2, and we have already seen that that's equal to RB divided by 1 plus G omega C2 RB. L and C1 are there as before. But what has been done is we have replaced the FET by its equivalent circuit, which is the gate is open, not connected to the source. It's essentially floating here. And between the drain and the source, there's this Voltage controlled current source given by GM VGS, where GM is the transconductance of the FET. In a more accurate model, we would have put in a RD in parallel with GM VGS, but RD typically is very huge, so we have chosen to ignore it for simplicity. So, this is the equivalent circuit which we are going to analyze to figure out whether you are going to get oscillations or not. The analysis again proceeds in essentially the same manner as before with a big, big difference. Though. Once again, we are not going to find out the loop gain and set that equal to 1 to check whether oscillations occur. We are just going to assume that there are voltages at the various nodes. And if we manage to find non-zero voltages at the end of the calculation, or we figure out the condition for which non-zero voltages will occur, that will give us conditions for oscillations to occur. Now, the moment below, now a while ago, I just said that voltages at the nodes, that of course means that we are going to analyze this by using Norton's nodal method. And there's a very good reason why we are using nodal method here as opposed to the mesh method that we had used earlier. In the mesh method, the variables that you deal with are currents and the BJD circuit being current controlled, you knew the relationships between currents much more. 
The FET, on the other hand, is a voltage-controlled device, and as a result, nodal voltages are easier to deal with. So we have the nodes marked G and D here with voltages VG and VD. These are, of course, AC voltages that we are talking about. We also have the source, but the source is grounded, so Vs is zero. And because Vs is zero, Vgs, the voltage which controls the current source, is actually given by Vg. It's, after all, Vg minus Vs, but Vs being zero, Vgs is the same as Vg. Now let's write down the nodal equations at the nodes G and D. If you try writing down the node equation at G, what you're going to get is the voltage there into the sum of the admittances which are joined to that, that is 1 by G omega L and 1 by Z, that, that from that you have to take away the voltage of the points which are connected to it times the admittance. So it's minus Vd into 1 by G omega L. Of course, you could also have had minus Vs by Z, but Vs is 0, so that term is not there. So you write this equation down. This whole thing has to be equal to 0 because this is nothing but the current flowing out of the node G, net current. That has to be 0 according to Kirchhoff's current law. So this can be easily solved or simplified to give you Vd equal to 1 plus G omega L by Z times Vg. So that gives me one condition between the two nodal voltages. For the other condition that you will need, what you need to do is write down the nodal equation for the point for the node D. And that again is pretty easy. You write Vd times 1 by G omega L. That's the, the admittance of the inductor that you can just see. And then you have plus G omega C1, that's the admittance of the capacitor, minus Vg by G omega L. That has to be equal to the net current flowing in from the current sources. But since this current is flowing out, you have to write this as minus Gm Vgs, which is equal to minus Gm Vg. Once again, this is just net current flowing out equals net current flowing in, Kirchhoff's voltage law. The minus sign is there simply because Net current flowing in through the current source is negative because it's not flowing into the node. By convention, it's flowing out. So you get minus Gm Vgs, which is minus Gm Vg. So now you have another equation relating Vd and Vg. And you can simplify that simply by multiplying this 2 by J omega L and moving the Vg to one side. So you get Vd into 1 minus omega square LC1 equals 1 minus Gm times J omega L times Vg. Now, all that is left is to take this expression, which you already have of Vd in terms of Vg, substitute it back here, and then use the fact that Vg is not zero to derive a condition which will ensure that Vg is not zero. That is the condition that ensures that oscillations will occur. Of course, if you wanted to be more sophisticated, you could have written both of these equations, these are linear equations, in matrix form. Then you would get a 2 by 2 matrix times a column vector with Vd and Vg equals another column vector with zeros on the other side. And the only way such a homogeneous set of linear equations will give you a non-trivial solution, a solution in which Vd and Vg are not both equal to zero, is by making the determinant vanish, determinant of the matrix, 2 by 2 matrix vanish, and Calculating the determinant setting that equal to 0 would give rise to the same condition. Anyway, if you just use simple algebra here, what you get is 1 minus omega square LC1, this factor, into 1 plus G omega L by Z, and I've just used the fact that Z is RB, divided by 1 plus G omega C to RB here. That must be equal to 1 minus J GM the omega L. The equation had VG as a factor on both sides, but since we are demanding that Vg is not zero, these factors have to be equal. Fine. Once again, this is the complex equation. So we can write down this real part and the imaginary part. If we write down the real part, you will see that you get 1 minus omega square LC1, of course, that's a real factor, into 1 
and you get a real number by multiplying these two things together, which is simply minus omega square LC2. So you get this times this equals 1, which after a very trivial manipulation gives you exactly the same expression for omega square that you had before. And that of course is nothing but the condition which makes x1 plus x2 plus x3 go to 0. So once again the frequency condition is satisfied in this case. The condition which will ensure that oscillations will occur, that is you have sufficient positive feedback for the oscillations to self-sustain is given by the imaginary part. The imaginary part of this expression, of course, is 1 minus omega square LC1 times omega L by RB from here and minus GM omega L from here. You can, of course, cancel out the omega L on both sides. And this gives us an expression for GM. As before, omega square LC1 is 1 plus C1 by C2 and 1 minus omega square LC1 is then minus C1 by C2. Using that, we get this expression. Gm is C1 by C2 into 1 by Rb. Once again, this is the condition for self-sustained oscillations. For oscillations to start, the transconductance Gm has to be bigger than this quantity. And usually Rb is pretty big in most circuits. So the right-hand side is pretty small. So this condition is satisfied more or less pretty easily for most situations. We will finish off today's lecture by introducing another kind of tank oscillator, a tuned oscillator. This is called the clap oscillator. As you can see, it's a small variant on the Colpix oscillator. I have drawn a BJT version here, which is essentially the same circuit as the one for the Colpix oscillator that we had drawn earlier, except that the inductance L has now been replaced by a series combination of an inductance L and one more capacitor, C3. Once again, C1, C2 and C3, all three capacitors, are small capacitances. And the frequencies that we are going to consider, where CB1, CB2 and CE are to be treated as shorts, these would still produce substantial impedance. Now, the AC equivalent small signal circuit for this is very easy to come by. All you have to do is take our earlier circuit and replace the L with a series combination of L and C3, which is exactly what we have done on the right. Now, I am not going to spend time analyzing the entire circuit for you all, all over again. Let this be an exercise for you. The analysis can be done in exactly a similar manner to the way we analyzed the BJT-based call pitch oscillator a while ago and all I'm going to do is tell you what the final result is as far as the frequency is concerned and that should not come as much of a surprise you will see that the final value for omega square turns out to be 1 over L times 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2 plus 1 over C3 very similar to the call pace expression, which really is 1 over L times 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2. And indeed, this is exactly what you would get if you were to just add up the reactances X1, X2, X3 and set that equal to 0. I will leave the task of finding out the condition on HFE for the oscillations to self-sustain for you to find out. Of course, for this, you have to analyze the whole circuit exactly in the same way as we had worked with the culprits a while ago. Now, there are many other different kinds of oscillators available and we simply cannot discuss all of them in this course. But I hope I have given you enough of a feel about how an oscillator is designed and at least given you some information about the common oscillators which you may encounter later on in the laboratory. We will next move on to another topic, digital electronics, but that is for a future lecture.